Imagine you lying on your deathbed, bemoaning your life and saying, I really regret that I never had the energy, courage, or time to, and then work on filling in those blanks. And I think it's something we have to ask ourselves often while we have time to change. This show is dedicated to helping you strengthen your family tree and live financially free. Welcome to the Marriage, Kids, and Money podcast, everybody. This is Andy Hill, and today we're talking about how to live a regret-free life. Discussion around death can inspire some important conversations about life. If I were to die tomorrow, what would I regret not doing? Or what would I regret doing too much of? It's an interesting question to ask ourselves. And for families who are pursuing financial independence, it can be a question that may be course correcting. To help us explore this topic further, I've invited Jordan Grummet on the podcast today. Jordan, aka Doc G, is a physician who discovered financial independence on the cusp of job burnout. He's currently an associate medical director at Journey Care Hospice, where he supports patients in their final days of living. His experience in financial independence and hospice care has come together in his new book, Taking Stock, a hospice doctor's advice on financial independence, building wealth, and living a regret-free life, which is out now. Welcome back to the show, Jordan. It is so great to be here. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. I'm glad to have this conversation. I'm glad to have you back on the podcast again to talk about this great book of yours. So let's talk about this. You've, you've, you've spent a great time going through this book and going through a very fulfilling career. What do you think it means to live a regret-free life? So this was something that I really was a little bit lost when I was thinking about because I realized I was financially independent. And so I had the money to do whatever I wanted to do with my life. But a lot of ways I had never thought about, well, what do I really want to do with my life? Working with the dying really opened my eyes because a lot of times we would take a person who got a terminal diagnosis, we would get their symptoms together, we'd get them on the right medicines, we'd make sure they were in a safe place, we'd get them ready to die. But often at some point we did something called the life review where they would talk about their lives and often they would say to me, I really regret that I never had the energy, courage, or time to... And then we would find out what was really important in their lives. So living a regret-free life to me is paying homage to our purpose, identity, and connections. It's paying attention to those things that are really important to us that we often put off. And the reason why is it's really, really hard work. So instead, we go after some of those false gods, things like net worth or even financial independence or achievement or job titles. These are all things we think will make us happy, but in a sense, I really think they're low-hanging fruit and they're easy. So we deal with that as opposed to asking the more difficult questions like, who am I? What has meaning to me? And specifically, if I found out I was going to die, what would I be sad that I didn't accomplish? Uh, what really touched me as I was listening to your book was the personal stories. Could you share some of those examples of maybe some of those regrets that uh, that could really help people understand what you've learned from this experience? You know, it's funny because one thing we do spend a lot of time talking about with the dying are their regrets, but there are also people who relive some of the great parts of their life. But sometimes the regrets can be more instructive. Let me tell you about a specific patient I took care of in her 40s and she, when she was in her 20s, got divorced. She was trying to have a baby. She had had her second miscarriage. She came back to her apartment to find her husband in bed with another woman. And that was it. She had enough. They weren't that connected. They didn't have any children yet. Their finances weren't majorly connected yet. They were still young in the beginning of their careers. So she walked out of that marriage, never said another word to him pretty much besides the divorce proceedings and went on with her life. And as she was dying in her 40s, we did a life review and she started talking about the fact that she now realized as she got older that while she didn't per se forgive him for what happened, she realized that he had a perspective, that he was hurting too, that this was a difficult situation for him. And so she decided to call her ex-husband up and talk to him after 20 years because she realized she didn't want to die without reconciling that important relationship. So often people's regrets have to do with people, right? Who are those people in our lives that we 
arrived at a stalemate and couldn't work things out? Who are those people we let go out of our lives that were important and we still wish we could communicate with them? Who are those people that we love that we never expressed it appropriately? After people, you really start talking about things that were purposeful or meaningful to people. And here's the thing. For every person, this is so different. So for some people, it's travel. I had a patient who we joked he always had his bags packed because when he found out that he was terminally ill, all of a sudden he had enough energy to take a bunch of vacations he had never taken. For other people, it can be something big. Like I had a patient who in his 20s decided to climb Mount Everest. And to do this, he had to take a year off of work and he pretty much stop making money. So a lot of us would say, wow, opportunity cost. You stop making money in your 20s. That money could compound over years. And think about how much that could be worth in your 40s or 50s. But he knew that this was of great importance to him. So he took that year off. He tried to climb Mount Everest. The weather changed. He never made it all the way up. But when he was dying in his 50s, you know, he would regale us with stories of being on Everest. This was a perfect example of someone who didn't have a regret. Uh, because they decided that the time to pursue something that was important, even if there were some costs involved, the time was now. And I, I think a big part of that, too, is we tend to forget. We think people regret when they fail to do things, and that's not really the case. What I've learned from the dying is we regret the things we didn't have the courage to try or put our heart into. Like my patient who tried to climb, climb Mount Everest and he never made it to the top, it wasn't not making it to the top that stuck with him. It was the fact that he tried and he could relive parts of that. So, you know, the dying have a lot to teach. And uh, it's really exciting to try to bring some of those messages to those of us who are young and healthy because we have so much more time to affect change in our lives. You just said right there, I, I've had a lot of chance to do some introspection this week, just thinking <laughs> of if tomorrow were my last day, what would I, yeah. what would I regret? And I think that... Um, Maybe that's an opportunity for people who are listening to do to do the same thing. You mentioned the hedonic treadmill. You talked about net worth and some of these other financial things that might be a distraction. But what is the hedonic treadmill? Hedonic treadmill, and then how can that lead to some of these regrets? Uh, I know you mentioned that in your book, and that's, it was interesting to me. So the idea of the hedonic treadmill treadmill is that we have a baseline setting of let's say contentedness or happiness, and often we do things to try to go above that baseline. For a lot of people, it's buying things, and we think if we buy something, it will make us happy. And in a sense, it does make us happy briefly, but then we tend to fall back to that baseline. So when we talk about people getting stuck on that hedonic treadmill, they're running, and they keep running and spinning their wheels, but they're not getting anywhere because they keep spending money to try to improve that baseline. And it feels good. We get a dopamine hit when it does that briefly. Um, but unfortunately, we tend to go back to baseline. So part of the punchline to that is buying things probably is not the way to happiness. The hedonic treadmill is interesting because it really describes one phenomena. I think there's a twin phenomena we often see here in personal finance, which in the book I call overdrive. A lot of us have the same process when it comes to money, and we look at net worth, and we do the same thing. We say, once we get to this net worth, it's going to make us happy, and indeed, the stock market goes up or we sell a business or we do something and we hit that net worth number, and we get that hit of dopamine and we feel great, but that doesn't last that long. Eventually we fall to our baseline and then we make the same mistake of the hedonic treadmill. We think, oh, we better make more money. That's what's going to make us more happy. And so we set a higher goal and then we're back off on that treadmill, that overdrive, those wheels spinning, but not getting anywhere. What I've come to learn is that those are kind of false goals, right? We set these goals up because we think they're part of our purpose and meaning and identity, and they're not. And therefore, when we get there, it doesn't make us particularly happy. And again, I would say that a, a lot of the reason we do this is it's low-hanging fruit. Like, it's really easy for me to say my goal in life is to get to this job title, or my goal in life is to hit financial independence or get to some net worth number. Now, don't get me wrong. It might be hard work to actually get there, but it's easy, right? We can work it out. I can side hustle. I can work more hours. I can bargain with my employer to get a higher salary. I can change jobs, right? So getting to financial independence, it's solvable. It's a mathematical problem that we can work on. That's a heck of a lot more comfortable than saying, what's my purpose? 
and how do I embrace my identity and using purpose and identity? How do I make uh, the right connections in life? It's much more ephemeral, much more hard to grab onto. And so in a lot of ways we avoid it, which is fine, except the thing that I learned from the dying is those are the things we tend to regret by not paying attention to them. Um, so I think, you know, we get stuck in the hedonic treadmill overdrive. They're great examples of some of the ways our brains get stuck on the things that probably in the end don't matter to us. I feel this balance. And I, I guess I've been, maybe I've been personally trying to discover this as well, even with the guests that I've been inviting on, is this balance of the traditional fire path and the YOLO path, right? I think both probably have positives to them, but they can probably both be taken to an extreme level. Would you agree? I think they can. And I believe that is one of the major issues that we face throughout our lives is how do we know when to spend today because you only live once, how to enjoy the moment, how to fulfill your sense of purpose, identity, and connections now versus the real fact that we may live into our 80s and 90s and have to defer gratification. We have to save for retirement. How to make that choice is one of the biggest problems we face. When I think of my book, I think of it as a play in three acts. The first act is figure out your purpose, identity, and connections. This is the first thing we should do. It's not the first thing we usually do, but it's the first thing we should do. The second act is once we understand our purpose, identity, and connections, build a path to financial independence with that in mind. But the third act is exactly what you're talking about here. Once we know what our purpose, identity, and connections are, once we have an idea of how our path to financial independence is going to be, then we have to say, how fast? How much do we enjoy today versus defer towards tomorrow? My favorite way to do this is to ask yourself one big question. And that question is, what do you fear most? Do you fear that you are going to die young and wealthy and never enjoy your money? Or do you fear that you are going to live to be an old person and die broke because you used all your money up? And if you can start thinking about which of those two things scares you most, you then can toggle the switch between YOLO and deferred gratification. You'll note that I ask you, what do you fear most? And the reason why is none of us knows when we're going to die. I don't know if that's going to be six years, 10 years, three decades. No one knows. So we can't make decisions based on that. If, if we knew, then we would say, oh, I'm going to die in 10 years. I better spend all my money and enjoy it for those 10 years versus, boy, I'm going to live another 40 years. I better really start saving and deferring gratification. We don't have that insight. So the only thing we can look at is what scares us most and then start making decisions based on that. So I think if you ask yourself that question, what scares you most, we then can build into the framework how quickly you move to, towards financial independence, how much you spend today versus how much you defer gratification. I think fear, um, although that sounds scary, it also motivates uh, how uh, how we're going to I guess, feel in our mental health as well as our physical health. Our mental health can drain our physical health. So if, we, if we're if we constantly worried about running out of money or constantly worried about not living a fulfilled life, those are the things that are going to help us to actually have that fulfilling life or that healthy life uh, because we'll be, I don't know, we'll just be thinking about them all the time, right? Yeah. And let's get granular here, right? So let's say you're trying to answer that question. Am I afraid that I'm going to die young and wealthy or old and broke? If you're afraid you're going to die young and wealthy, then we can start making plans. Let's say you make your salary, you use 50% on the must-haves, right? Paying rent, buying food, clothes, transportation. You can't do much about that, right? So you pay the first 50% of your take-home pay doing that. You then have 50% left over. If you're worried about dying young, I would suggest that maybe 40% of that leftover should go into a YOLO fund. And maybe 10% should go into financial independence fund. I think everyone, no matter where you fall on the spectrum, should work to financial independence. We should build that framework, but you can toggle it based on where you are. So let's see what happens. If you die young, like you're expecting, and that's why you put 40% in the YOLO fund, well, at least then you used your money towards purpose, identity, and connections, and you used a lot of it, right? So you kind of won the game, not because you died, but at least you planned appropriately and used your money appropriately. Let's say you're wrong and you end up dying at 85 or 90. Well, guess what? You're probably going to work until 65 or 70. You're not going to retire early on a 10% savings rate. But you know what? 
you're using that 40% every year up into your 60s and 70s, doing what you want with it, taking great vacations, buying those things that excite you, using it for your purpose, identity, and connections. That ain't so bad either. So let's flip the switch. What if you're like me and you're like, I think I'm going to live to an old age and I'm afraid of running out of money. Well, then you do the kind of traditional fire thing. 50% goes to expenses, 50% left over, 40% into my deferred gratification retirement fund, 10% for YOLO today. I'm still enjoying life some. I'm still spending on what's important to me, um, but I'm getting my money into the stock market and compounding. Let's say I'm right. Awesome. I'm going to have a huge retirement fund. I'm going to retire at 40, 45, and I'm going to be living a life of freedom after that. Let's say I'm wrong. Now, here's the one thing that we can't do much about. If you think you're going to live forever and defer gratification, and you know what? You die unexpectedly young, you kind of, that's the worst of all the scenarios. You can't do much about that. I can say a few things. One is you're still probably excited because building your financial independence path was exciting for you and you were digging it, even though it didn't come to fruition. But the other point is this does argue the fact that even if we are going to grind it out and go for that traditional financial independence pathway that's really fast, we still need to take the time to enjoy today a little bit, especially when we're young. Because if we think about it, we have different seasons in our lives. And when you're young and grinding it out and making a lot of money, you might be a newlywed and you're only a newlywed once. You might have young kids or babies and you only have babies once. So even if you're grinding it out, we still have to be mindful to fulfill that sense of purpose, identity, and connection, sometimes we might even have to slow down a little bit. So I think those are kind of all the scenarios, and that's why asking this question is so important about what scares us the most. I think I've been uh, extreme at times in my fire journey, uh, you know, whatever I want to call it. I mean, there's been some times where I, I look back and I regret not taking that trip with my guy friends in my 20s or 30s because I was trying to pay off my mortgage early or, wh or whatever, be become debt free or whatever my my goal was. And so I look back and I say, I, you know, I probably could have, I probably could have taken my foot off the gas a little bit more. But I think these extreme examples of fire, you know, maybe that maybe the Mr. Money Mustache example uh, is a good way, at least for me, to put some goalposts, being like, okay. Here's an extreme example. And then there's also, you know, the, the YOLO example of like, I'm spending every single, I'm going to spend more than I have coming in. Um, and so I, I, I think I've been interested as of late in these middle ground definitions of fire or, or sort of this rise of, of things uh, that are in the middle ground. Can you talk about some of those other examples that maybe I know you define some of in the, in the book that people might be interested in that sort of ride this middle ground? Uh, and I definitely can. And let's start still with the basics. And I keep on coming back to this because I think it's important. The goal of money, the goal of our lives, the thing we don't want to regret or the thing we want to be regret free from is we want to live a life of purpose, identity, and connections. The traditional fire path kind of said, you're not going to have time for that at the beginning of life, but you're going to grind it out, make lots of money, get to a net worth number, retire early, and then you're going to have the rest of your life to live out that purpose, identity, and connections, right? So over time, things have evolved, and a lot of young people have come into this movement, and they've said, I don't want to grind it out. I want to start living a life of purpose, identity, and connections today, as well as save for retirement, as well as possibly retire early or early-ish. So then became the question of, can you both enjoy today as well as buy into this FIRE financial independence movement? And because movements evolve, we've found that there are a lot of interesting, great ways to still live a life of purpose, identity, and connections today, as well as save for financial independence. So you'll see all the different monikers, slow-fi, coast-fi, barista-fi. But the idea of all of these is it says, wait a minute, let's slow down. Let's not grind it out. Let's enjoy today as well as tomorrow, but let's be really thoughtful, intentional about it. So Slow fi is this idea that instead of grinding it out eight to six at a high paying job, maybe we slow down our path to financial independence a little bit. Maybe we either take a job we love that pays less. So our path to financial independence takes longer, but we're living our real purpose, identity, and connections today. Or maybe we work the same job, but less hours, right? So that again, this slows our pathway down, but it gives us ample time and emotional space to start doing other things we like now. 
And so I think that's a real bright way to go about it. That's slow fi. Coast fi is just this idea that if we can stack our retirement accounts with enough money early, we know that over the years in compounding, that money will eventually hit our financial independence number. So if we can get the right amount in early, which we can calculate with basic math skills, we then can start living today and only making enough money to cover our costs, which means we may be able to work less hard. We might be able to take a job again that's more life-affirming. We might be able to spend more time with our friends and families or hobbies or things that we like more. Maybe it'll give us more time to pursue a side hustle, which eventually makes money and then lets us pull away even further from those jobs we don't like. So I think these are brilliant takes on financial independence. I think this has become a natural evolution from what FIRE started as. And uh, I think it's a real addition to our community and it's a real addition to people's lives. uh, Because as I kind of said from working with the dying, and you know what, my father died at 40 unexpectedly. So I'm very aware of this fact that we don't know when our day is going to come. So we should start working on purpose, identity, and connections now. And sometimes that means slowing down our FI pathway. Yeah. And I think uh, when when folks hear these, whatever, big goals, whether it's traditional FI or Coast FI or any of these big things, and they're, and they're just starting out, it can seem so far away towards that life that they want to get to. You talk about uh, subtraction, using that in our lives in your book. Uh, to help us get to there. Can you talk a little bit about maybe how you use that personally or how other, others can do the same? So I think it's really important to first talk about my story and then separate it. And the reason why is I, I come from a place of real privilege. And what I mean by that is when I realized I was financially independent, it was unexpected. And so I started the process of subtraction when I already had a lot of money in my coffers. I had investments, I had real estate. So I started from a privileged place, but when I realized I was financially independent, I thought about leaving medicine completely, but then realized that I was so tied into that identity that I didn't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I didn't want to make a sudden change. I really needed to contemplate what medicine meant in my life and if there still was a part of my identity that was attached to it. So what I did is I started looking at my job. I knew I had enough money. It gave me the power to start removing the friction in my life. So what parts of my job were causing me friction and could I remove them? So the first thing to go was my private practice. I had a private practice. I was getting called out on weekends. I was really busy and stressed. I stopped doing that work, which left me with nursing homework and hospice work. And that immediately improved my life by subtracting out the one thing that was causing me most stress. I did this for quite a while, but then I realized the nursing homework was causing me stress. And being financially independent, I had some real choices. I didn't want to get called in the middle of the night anymore. I didn't want to get called on the weekends. So I eventually got rid of that. I subtracted that out. What was left was hospice work. I stopped doing nights. I stopped doing weekends. I decided to be a consultant as opposed to an employee. I ended up working about 15 hours a week, and this I would do even if I wasn't getting paid for. So I knew that I had subtracted enough from this place of privilege, had enough money, that I got to the most succinct description of what I wanted to do with my time that really added to my sense of purpose, identity, and connections. That was me, and I came at this from a place of privilege. Let's talk about your average person who doesn't come at this at a place of privilege. Let's say you're in your early 20s. You have an 8 to 6 or 9 to 5 job, and you have no choice. That job pays your bills, and you can't leave it. You can't do less hours. And at the moment, it's the only job you have, so there's not a lot to subtract there. So the question is, how do people who aren't in as great of a financial situation use the art of subtraction? Well, first and foremost, we think of money as a tool. And in fact, we should think of it as a tool to get to our purpose, identity, and connections, not as a goal, which is a big mistake we all make. So money is a tool, but there's something amazing when you're in your 20s. You have a bunch of other tools. One of them is your energy. The other are your skills, your hobbies, your passions. So let's say you're working that eight to six, but you're 22, 23 years old. You have a lot of energy. You can't subtract much from that job, but you know what you can do? Maybe on Saturdays and Sundays, you spend a few hours of those days building up a side hustle. And here's what you do. That side hustle is something you are passionate about. It fulfills a sense of purpose, identity, and connections. It's something you might even consider doing, even if you weren't making money at it, because God knows you probably won't make any money in the beginning. So by doing that, 
you are fulfilling your sense of purpose, identity, and connections. You are following a passion, and you're still working your normal drudgery eight to six. But over time, let's say that side hustle builds, and you start making a little money doing it. Well, now you haven't really forfeited anything by starting the side hustle because, again, it was something you were interested in anyway, but now you've created a little space. Maybe you make a little cash. Maybe instead of eight to six, you can start working nine to five because you're just making a little bit of cash in that side hustle. Let's say that side hustle grows. Maybe it grows and it can pay 50% of your income needs, and you can leave that job that you were doing that eight to six, which you don't like, and start a job which doesn't pay any better, but you like it a little more, or you can do it for a few less hours. The point is, what tools can you use to create space in your life, even when you're fighting to put dinner on the table? Do you have any tools out there that you can start using to create that space so you can slowly subtract out the things that don't support your purpose, identity, and connections and add in the things that do and yet still economically survive? So I think subtraction works both for the people who are getting close to financial independence as well as the people who are nowhere near But we got to start recognizing that we have more tools than just money and that the goal is purpose, identity, and connections and not some net worth. And when you take all that into account, you realize, I've got a little wiggle room here. How can I start using that wiggle room to live a better life today and not wait until, A, you're either financially independent or, God forbid, you've been diagnosed with a terminal illness and have to look back on your life and decide what you haven't done? I love it, man. I, 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 one question I have as a as a father, you know, we've uh, we've we, you've you've lived a good life. You've had a multiple different career paths or multiple different, I guess, versions of, of life. As as a dad, how has your experience, I guess, maybe shaped the way that you parent or raise your child when you think about things like college and, I guess, career planning? I, I, talk to me about that. So I think what I've learned is what kids really follow most is your modeling. So I've really concentrated both my wife and I on modeling the behavior of we use the tools we have available to control what we fill our time with, and we choose to fill our time with things that are meaningful and add to our sense of purpose and identity. And so my kids growing up saw the picture of a father who slowly removed himself from medicine by financially planning well so that then he could pursue something that did have a sense of identity and connections for him by becoming a, what I call a communicator, right? A podcaster, a blogger, a public speaker. And so I think that's what we can teach our children is start with purpose, identity, and connections If you can figure out what some of those things are in your life, then when you're young is the perfect time to say, okay, now how do I build my financial life around those things? And you know what? When you're 16 or 18 or 20, what you think is purposeful for you that then may not be purposeful for you in a few years. Your identity as a 16-year-old may be completely different than your identity as a 30-year-old. That's totally fine. The point is, Can we start making these intentional decisions based on purpose, identity, and connections now, and then pivot accordingly when we see that it's not fulfilling our needs? I think if we can teach our young people that, the other decisions become a lot easier, like go to college or not go to college, go to trade school, start that business. I mean, all of these things become a lot more clear when you start with purpose, identity, and connections what is meaningful for me today? And then can I start building that into a financial model? At the beginning of the conversation, you and I started talking about, I mean, uh, you know, the, the, I guess it's, I, I guess you could call it a blessing or a moment in time where you could say, maybe I'm not dying tomorrow, but could we simulate that it's experience for ourselves to maybe say, you know, am I living the the life that I want to live? Am I living a regret-free life? Talk to the person who's listening to that and maybe give them some instruction how we can do that earlier than later and start moving towards purpose, identity, and connection. So in the book, there are a number of exercises. um, And one of them is something we do with hospice patients, but I really feel like young people should be doing on a yearly basis, something called the life review. And I'm not going to go through a whole life review here, but it's a series of questions that ask us Things like, what is purposeful to us? What are the important relationships we have? What are our biggest successes? What are our biggest failures? What are our biggest hopes for the future? 
and start integrating those into our thought process. Now, the shortcut to that, the easy exercise to do to kind of get the same effect is a visualization technique. And what I ask you to visualize is exactly what we talked about before. Imagine you lying on your deathbed, bemoaning your life and saying, I really regret that I never had the energy, courage, or time to... And then work on filling in those blanks. And I think it's something we have to ask ourselves often while we are young, while we have time to change. And I think that's a good first step is do that visualization technique. What do I really regret that I never had the energy, courage, or time to do if I was lying on my deathbed? That's step one. Step two, that's purpose. Let's start talking about identity. A great way to start looking into identity is asking yourself over and over again or saying the statement, I am, and then filling in the blank. And so when I first did this, I said, I am a doctor, which is funny because I don't even really identify much like that anymore. But you know, usually the lowest hanging fruit, the easiest stuff comes first. Then you start talking about family. I am a son. I am a father. I'm a spouse. Eventually, you get to achievements. I am a Plutus Award winner for the Earn and Invest podcast. But if you keep asking this and working on this, eventually you get to the deeper stuff. For me, it was I am a podcaster, a writer, a speaker. I am a communicator. Um, And you can be really aspirational here, like not what you are today, but what you want to be. And if you don't even know the answer to those things, start asking your family and friends, how do they see you? What do they see you as? So those are two really good exercises to start with, the visualization about death and then for identity to fill in the blank, I am, and really work on that. And once you start doing those two things, something interesting happens when you get more in touch with your purpose and identity, the connections you make tend to be stronger. I was a perfect example of this. I never connected with doctors, doctor friends, doctor lounges, none of it ever fit. When I realized that my identity was as a communicator, I started going to personal finance conferences. And it was like, I connected to people in minutes the way I never had in years in healthcare. And I knew I had met my people. So purpose, identity, and connections, some simple exercises. Work on them today. And I think you'll find you have a much richer life and a richer connection to the people around you. I love that. And, and I'll, I'll add, if you don't mind, uh, do it with your spouse as well. You know, this could be a great way to uh, connect further. And maybe you could figure out how you can yeah, help totally. each other get to where you want to go in the future. Jordan, this has been a fantastic conversation. Tell us about where people can get your new book and where people can listen to this podcast. So Taking Stock, A Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth, and Living a Grip Free Life is available anywhere that you can find books. Uh, Specifically, if you're online, Amazon, Books A Million, Target, wherever you want. The easiest way to learn about me as well as the order of the book is you can go to my personal website. That is jordangrummet.com. J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-U-M-E-T.com. There you will find links to the book. You'll also find links to my major kind of content endeavors. One of those is the Earn and Invest podcast. The other is the Diversify blog. And last but not least, I wrote a medical blog from like 2005 or so to 2018. And over a thousand posts are over there too. All that you can get to from jordangrummet.com. If you just want to listen to my podcast, earnandinvest.com is the easiest way to get there. Excellent. Uh, Jordan, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it, man. Your, your book was very impactful for me as I went on my walks this week and uh, definitely gave me a lot of moments to take these big questions and, and ask myself if I'm heading uh, towards uh, purpose, identity, and connection. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me and thank you for your kind words about the book. 